Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's nice to be here again. The, I've been to Danish um, Citrus or Danish California uh, Collaboration uh, Workshop every year for five years in a row. And in addition, um, uh, I've been also the um, uh, Citrus Director at Davis for 10 years, and it's nice to see this collaboration continue and so on. Uh, so today I'll talk about the uh, 2D, 3D integrated photonics for mode division, space division, multiplexing. Uh, I, may, I noticed that in this session there is uh, SDM uh, and also mode division multiplexing discussions as well as RF photonics. So I'm going to start with kind of a little bit about RF photonics leading into the um, uh, OAM and uh, space division multiplexing. Um, what we like to do is to put a lot of information onto a limited amount of resources. Uh, single mode fiber, especially in long distance, is very scarce. So we like to put more and more information. And there has been about 2.5 dB per year. This is a slide from René Assembre. And what we are seeing is that when you go from single channel to multiple wavelength and start to put more and more information in a limited amount of bandwidth, therefore the spectral efficiency has been going up. Now, the spectral efficiency, though, um, you can only do so much with putting a lot of information bits on it. Just like in 3G, 4G wireless, the optical is also going with the coherent with, um, say, BPSK, QPSK, and trying to go to 16 QAM and so on, but there are practical limits. Uh, Shannon's law tells you that as you go to higher spectral efficiency, you like to go, you need to go to having a lot of signal noise ratio. However, with a given amount of noise, you have to have lots of power, and each time you have added one bit per second hertz spectral efficiency, you have increased the um, sequence noise ratio or power for the given amount of noise by 3 dB. Uh, that means that with the chi 3 or optical curl effect, you will see about 9 dB increase in nonlinear optical effects. This is a huge problem. So there are some people who try to go 10, dB, 10, 10, 10 bits per spectra, uh, second hertz or some really high spectral efficiency. But it makes more sense to kind of step back and just like we did in the WDM, you go to higher bit rate, but then at some point you branch out to parallelism. At that point we branched out to WDM and we now branched out to coherent communication. It is time, time now for us to branch into space division multiplexing. Uh, as the movie Enterprise um, says, uh, space, our final frontier. So we go to large number of spectral efficiency. The nice thing is that if you put more channels, instead of having one, d one bit per second hertz with the 3 dB, as you increase the spectral channel, you have linear increase in spectral efficiency. So we can actually start to overcome this nonlinear um, uh, channels uh, limit uh, by having the uh, multiple channels. And as you have multiple spatial channels, you can actually dilute the intensity so you can actually uh, avoid a lot of these uh, nonlinear effects as well. So what I'm going to talk about first is to talk about elastic networking, kind of communication, and, uh, and then kind of look into the spatial vision multiplexing. Uh, what we know is that uh, we like to communicate over long distance with uh, reconfigurability and optics. Initially, we did this in Monet and TP Lees here. We built a lot of the WDM lasers, put a lot of this wavelength on a grid, and put uh, multiple bit rates there. But this does not really give you uh, high spectral efficiency, so we are now moving towards something like wireless. In wireless communication, you kind of put any slice of communication bands. You have 3G, 4G all mixed up, and you try to utilize the available spectrum as a 10 hertz, uh, terahertz spectrum as efficiently as possible. <clears throat> so you, you're doing elastic optical networking in temporal spectral domain, and then we're going to talk about spatial domain elasticity step, step by step. So basically the idea is to use spectrum efficiently and flexibly capacity flow and accommodate the sub-channel capacity. And then now we have a lot of um, communication needs between data centers that need like 400 gigabit second traffic, you open up the circuit, close down elastically, that's very, very important. And now with the space between the multiplexing, you can go beyond multiple terabits per second. So I'm going to skip through some of these slides, but um, um, I'm also very pleased to see my former student, um, Nick Fontaine, who has been working on this while he was at um, Davis. Now he's at uh, Bell Labs working on various projects. Here, are the, what we do is that uh, in, in terms of getting elastic optical networking, 
we uh, use the optical arbitrary waveform generation, where you utilize the optical frequency combs and you modulate on a channel by channel basis coherently. And then when you combine them, then you can actually start to have scalable terahertz band uh, elastic optical network and transmitter, where you can define any slice as you like, and each slice can have any modulation format you like. In some sense, if you have certain uh, temporal spectral uh, modulation that you like to have, you can inverse uh, Fourier transform on each one of those modulators and apply appropriate electrical uh, amplitude phase modulation or IQ modulation. Another thing that's very important is that you can actually reduce the high uh, peak to average power ratio by appropriately shaping the pulse so that you can go through long distance fiber. So we did fabricate a device with uh, indophosphite. We have DMOX and MOX and amplitude and phase modulators, each one driven at 10 gigahertz type of spectrum, uh, the uh, RF signals, driven by electrical um, uh, drivers. And we scaled this up to a um, uh, 100 channel device where you have indophosphite wafer with 1,200 um, independently controllable devices that can do IQ modulation, and then we have phase uh, controller to achieve uh, phase error correction. So our uh, 1,200 device chip itself is a wafer that occupies the entire two-inch wafer. Let me uh, skip through this a little bit. Um, in terms of the coherent optical source, where we have multiple different uh, sources, one is to use the indium phosphide-based uh, colliding pulse mode lock laser that provides the uh, optical comb separated 10 gigahertz that feeds into the AWGs. More recently, what we've been doing is to look into a high-Q resonator by driving the high-Q resonator with a CW laser. You can drive the nonlinearity and step-by-step step create the optical frequency combs that fills up like a terahertz or 10 terahertz bandwidth and each one separated at, say, 10 gigahertz again, so they can fit into OAWG device. So this is a fabricated device, uh, 100 channel with a 17 dB extinction ratio on the indium phosphide AWG. And then followed by this, it would be a, a IQ modulator uh, that's all optically driven. And my students have measured um, various waveforms, QPSK and OAWG, and these are uh, temporal spectral domain uh, measurement in a time, and you have spectral domain. It's, even though you have 10 gigahertz comb, you can actually uh, create a continuum of these uh, IQ uh, modulated signals. And we have gone up to um, 1.2 terabit per second, and we try to emulate 16 QAM signal with the limited number of bits of 120 bits and so on. The next would be to kind of think about how we're going to measure so that you have a transmitter that can do elastic optic networking in temporal spectral domain. The question is how are we gonna make the receiver? And um, um, Nick Fontaine, who was doing PhD at the time, said, oh, Professor you that's easy. You just kind of flip it. So instead of coherently modulating and coherently combining them, you coherently split them and coherently detect them by using uh, optical frequency comb. And that actually, Worked. We had we have basically uh, DMOX for the comb source, DMOX for the optical signal, and then you do coherent detection on a slice by slice basis, and you synthesize the signal, and we're able to generate the waveform. This is the silica based uh, DMOX for the reference, DMOX for the optical uh, signal, and then you have coherent um, optical hybrid followed by the detector, and each one of those electrodes are to control the phase so that you can actually have good IQ, 90-degree um, phase shift uh, detection. So this was the detected signal over uh, after 25-kilometer transmission across about 450 gigahertz, and it's a real-time measurement of the uh, amplitude and phase shown in blue and red in the frequency domain and temporal domain. So in the future, what we like to do is to make an integrated photonic chip that is a transceiver consisting of optical frequency comb generator feeding into arbitrary waveform generation that can spend, say, terahertz or 10 terahertz um, elastic optical transmitter driven by CMOS D2A converter. So that finishes the uh, transmitter. On the receiver side, you receive the signal, split them, coherently detect, 
by splitting the optical field comb signal using the DMOX, and you have CMOS uh, trans impedance amplifier that feeds out the uh, signal. So that, so far, this is basically the idea behind the uh, temporal spectral domain um, uh, optical, uh, elastic optical network transmitter receiver. There's a lot of um, um, DSPs required for this type of processing. What we like to do is to use optical technology to relieve the load on the DSP. The first thing would be to use something like a, a lattice filter. In electronics, people use lattice filter based on inductor and capacitor and resistor. Here, what we're doing is you have coupler and uh, tap delay line and repeat them and bias them differently to create a finite impulse response filter in the optical domain that is capable of doing filtering in the RF domain. Or you, do, you put resonator and create the imp infinite impulse response filter to create the uh, similar type of filters. And uh, we were able to fabricate such a device with uh, silicon photonics. And um, I'm just going to skip through some. And we can see that our device was able to handle, say, um, um, notch filter as well as uh, band pass filter of various sh shape by controlling the um, PIN diode of the silicon photonics that would move the uh, poles and zeros around. So then, kind of, that's kind of the uh, uh, half of my talk introducing the elastic optical networking. Now, this, what we like to do is to now do this elastic optical networking in time, spectral, space, and spa uh, frequency domain. The space domain, what we like to do is to put elastic spatial mode. So, and then we like to use 2D and 3D photonic devices so that we can put a lot of capacity there. And the way, way to do this is to cascade the OAWG, OAWM together with the uh, uh, space division multiplexing, multiplexer, and demultiplexer. So the technology we're using is uh, first uh, orbital angular momentum. I know that Alan gave a nice talk yesterday. Um, you have basically the same device you use for AWG. What we're doing is to put that uh, AWG, the free propose region, that will convert the location information. Let's say you put in from port zero, port one, and port two into the phase tilt. So depending on the location, you have different phase tilt that will um, hit the uh, sampled aperture and that will have different amount of phase information along the uh, azimuthal angle. So if you, hit, if you came in on an equal zero, you hit all the apertures at the same phase. So you actually have a basically a, a plane wave coming out. But if you came in on equal one, it will have two pi phase evolution per uh, azimuthal angle, then you have kind of L equals one, one being the uh, OAM state. And if you came with L equals minus one, you have opposite uh, tilt and so on. So these are kind of the um, uh, generated waveforms from that uh, OAM uh, device. And the nice thing about this is just like the WDM MUX and DMUX, you can actually superimpose multiple signals together so you can actually have multiple OM states coming out together. So you can actually work this as a OM multiplexer. On the receiving end, you have multiple OM states coming in, and each one will come out at uh, azimuthal with a different OM state. So this can work like a simultaneous MUX and DMUX as part of your elastic optical networking. The elasticity comes from the fact that uh, you can utilize the system with, say, 16 OM state system to eight and so on. So you can actually combine L equals zero and L equals one into, say, L1 prime and so on. So you can actually do elastic optical networking in time, space, spectral domain. So this is the device that, that we fabricated based on the principle. The, our free propagation region is here. You can come in with the five different states, and it will, it will excite the uh, uh, spatial grating, vertical grating, with the apertures that excites L equals zero, one, two, and so on. And this is the actual fabricated silicon photonic device. We actually went ahead and uh, made more advanced devices based on better uh, gratings and so on. With that, we were able to make, make uh, 33 state and the nine state OM device in a very, very compact form factor that will fit into uh, something like um, uh, uh, eight millimeter by eight millimeter type of die. With this device, we're able to launch a, uh, five different OM states and then detect five different OM states together. So it's just a kind of a, Free, prepare, uh, free space based uh, transmission link. And um, uh, we were able to uh, have 
error free or the uh, below bit error rate um, of 10 to the minus 3 for the uh, fold error correction and so on. So this is the, um, so far the device that we use was the two-dimensional device that allows us to emit from the space. I think the scalability is good, but one challenge here is because we're using grating, the using polarization multiplexing on top of space, time, and frequency domain is difficult. So what we decided to do is to now look into a three-dimensional waveguide. The principle is the same. The first stage is a 2D waveguide with the same FPR, free frequency region. So then coming in with the different input ports will generate different uh, phase tilt. And then we have the path length matched 3D waveguide that receives the signal from 2D waveguides and then sends out an, uh, an, a concentric aperture. So then from here, um, you can actually generate the different OM states directly out of, uh, coming out of it. And um, um, different OM states excited here will superimpose outside this expert. So, this is the device that, uh, in collaboration with uh, Arcatel Lucent, fabricated at uh, Arcatel Lucent with silicon PLC, and that device goes into this device. And this is the fabricated uh, 3D uh, waveguide seen from the output facet. And in our group, we make these lasers. Uh, we use the femtosecond lasers to inscribe the 3D waveguides directly. This is our uh, setup where we have uh, nanopositioners that can scan at 100 millimeter per second and you can impose these uh, laser structures onto this forecast so you can actually inscribe the lasers directly. So we have made a device that has um, 16 apertures and we were able to test and fabricate and test the uh, OM state zero, minus one, minus two, uh, and so on. We were able to generate uh, 16 uh, OM states and uh, as you look at the different waveguide apertures, the linearity is very good uh, after we do the uh, phase error correction. So with this device, uh, again, we were able to make even better um, elastic optical networking device, so transmitter and receiver. And with the free space uh, propagation, we were able to generate uh, 16, 15 different OM states and then put the coherent uh, signals on it. So by combining OAWG, OAWM together with this uh, OAM, MOX and DMOX, we can actually start to do elastic optical networking in time, space, and uh, spectral domains. Our next frontier is to go beyond the OAM. OAM is nice because it provides very uh, uh, well-defined orthogonal states, but it has a limitation that when you try to couple into the fiber, you have to use ring core fibers, or you, there also, there's also amount of, some amount of intermixing or crosstalk between OAM states. What might be nice is to look at multi-mode fiber or few-mode fiber and select certain states that have reasonably separated eigenvalues and launch those states and then propagate through the fiber. And I think uh, Nick Fontaine is going to give a nice talk after this. So, uh, so basically, you can look into Lagrange Gaussian modes, uh, even Harmony Gaussian modes. Uh, typically, we like to look into LP modes into uh, multi-mode fiber. Then what we need to do is to kind of think about OAM type of devices stacked on top of each other and then start to generate this radially and uh, azimuthally controlled uh, amplitude uh, states. There are, again, um, they are again orthogonal to each other, which means that you can actually excite multiple of those spatial modes together. And if you are successful and launch this light into the multi-mode fiber, you can actually uh, attempt to transmit these type of multiple orthogonal OM states or the multiple uh, spatial modes through the fiber. So this is actually a device that we fabricated. So far, we fabricated a three-layer device. And um, we also incorporate many different kinds of gray things to see which one works the best. And um, this is the emission from the bottom, middle, and the top. And this is kind of movie. And this looks like a, a firework. <laughs> so we can actually go back and forth. And we are now making the devices in the five layers and so on, and coherently coupled with the uh, launching pads and so on. So we'll be able to generate the um, kind of Lagrange like Gaussian modes or the LP modes step by step. So, so now what I'm, what I'm showing now is that uh, we're currently writing a three-dimensional laser um, waveguides with multiple concentric rings. My student Bin Bin has worked with uh, uh, Nick Fontaine to make a routing software that has design rules where design rules allow us to have equal path length 
uh, amongst uh, multiple uh, waveguides without having these waveguides too close to each other. So um, that one is working fairly well. We fabricated multiple devices, um, and these are with the um, uh, rectangular lattice seen from the front, slightly tilted. You can actually see some of these 3D waveguides spanning out in different directions. And these are for our ONR project where we're trying to make beam steering device. So the, this is also, you can use this for Lagre Hermit uh, Gaussian modes instead of Lagre Gaussian modes. These are devices that are designed for OAM. We have not yet written a concentric ring devices yet, but um, uh, we're also working with Foundry that provides some of these devices as well. And these are concentric ring, and then seen from the kind of top sideways, and then this is from the top. You can actually see this wave guys propagating. Um, my second part of the talk that I won't be able to have time to talk about is to look into this 3D wave guys going beyond just the telecom, what we are also interested in is to look at uh, data centers and computers and chip-to-chip -chip, uh, communications. And um, so far, we use femtosecond lasers to directly write 3D waveguides. Um, people at Karlsruhe in Germany have written these polymer-based waveguides to make submicron uh, polymer waveguides. Basically, you write these uh, 3D patterns, and then you put this uh, polymer into a developer, and then the unexposed region will develop out, the exposed regions will stay. So you can actually see these uh, nanowires that can be used for chip-to-chip -chip interconnects. So I think that's really exciting. Um, in telecom, we had kind of a 90 to 10 rule where your core network may have 90% capacity that's going through, as, and, as well as you have 10% traffic that adds and drops. In computing network, it's actually the opposite. Inside the data center, you may have 90% or teraflop or terabytes of communication. So you actually need a lot of capacity inside the computer. And one of the things that we're interested in doing is to use that 3D waveguides and 3D interconnects in the um, 3D photonic electronic integrated chip. Already there is uh, communication going on with the, uh, uh, through the chip. So that concludes my talk. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for this interesting presentation. So uh, let's take uh, one or two questions. Yes, please. So, first of all, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, if you have, if you can have these 16 modes uh, simultaneously, if you emit them simultaneously, or? Okay. I didn't hear. So if you have 15 modes, do what? So you have 16 modes that you can emit, but I wonder if you can emit them simultaneously. Right. And the other question is if you have an idea of the uh, conversion efficiency, um, I mean the, the emission efficiency of the, of the modes. Are you talking about the conversion efficiency in terms of loss or yes, length yes, to length? Yes. Okay. The, uh, there's, just like in uh, AWG type of MOX and DMOX, fundamentally there is no loss if you're right in the center. Uh, in, in practice, FPR loses some light because of the finite uh, dimensions of fabrication. In our device, we have about 0.1 dB per centimeter type of propagating loss. Otherwise, uh, the other losses are similar to AWG. Your FPR region will lose some light. But there's no fundamental loss mechanism. This is not a splitter. It's a multiplexer and demultiplexer. And then the other question, one of the simultaneously operation of all the 16 modes. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, we are looking into that. And so far, we have done up to four because there is a lot of coherent crosstalk between them. So reducing this crosstalk is a challenge. When you had temporal spectral, and when you do MOX and DMOX, you do time domain or spectral domain, so you can actually avoid the coherent crosstalk. When you have OM states, you have to accommodate all the temporal spectral uh, information. Any uh, crosstalk between OM states or the spatial mode will show up as a coherent crosstalk. That's a challenge. Uh, yes, please, let's take another question. Very nice work. Uh, so this, uh, when you have these, uh, uh, the different schemes you have, uh, are, they, uh, are the wavelengths independent? Can you combine them with your spatial? Yeah, the question is, is it wavelength independence? It, so we took careful steps to make every path the same length. Therefore, the device is completely blind to temporal spectral information. So if any elastic uh, information you put in in temporal spectral domain, will transparently go in 
And if you excite multiple uh, space debris multiplexing states, state, they will come in as completely orthogonal dimension. So our free propagator reagent in the space with the multiplying device is supposed to be wavelength uh, blind. They are just geometrically giving path length difference, difference. In practice, the material itself has some dispersion. Okay. Yes. No, no, go ahead. I was checking, do, do you have an idea of how much crosstalk you have I mean, when you were mentioning? Is it 20 dB or? Yeah, the crosstalk we measured is about minus uh, 15 dB in energy. That means that coherently you have about minus 8 dB in E field. And that becomes a huge problem. You actually have to reduce down below minus 40 dB so that the E field ratio is below minus 20 dB.